One of the biggest challenges in evolution biology is trying to understand the origin of true novelties. Some of those novelties, innovations in evolution, um, are also um, called key innovations because they allow a group of organisms to take over a whole new ecological niche and expand be well beyond their ancestors. So there are very few examples of such novelties which are actually truly explained. One of the novelties we're trying to understand is evolution of the avian skull uh, with its beak and with its um, very unusual characteristics which make it very different from the skulls of its ancestors, the theropod dinosaurs, how it evolved, why it evolved, and uh, what molecular process took place. So to understand the evolution of the birds as a class, and class Avis is one of the most successful groups of animals on our planet. There are over 10,000 species. There are dozens of families and orders of these um, animals. They can be found anywhere on the planet. They can be found in the water, uh, on the surface, above the surface. They are capable of powered flight, one of the two groups of uh, vertebrates which are capable of powered flight. And they're extremely successful. And they're successful because, again, their ability to fly and their highly unusual skull and very uh, interesting, uh, very diverse beaks, which allow them to feed on different types of foods, uh, do different functions, very complicated tool. So that's what we're trying to explain. To um, understand the evolution of birds, we need to look at the history and uh, the entire lineage of Archosauria um, that um, began back in the Triassic. So about 250 million years ago, the reptiles split into two major groups. One group stayed small, and uh, they focused on small prey, such as insects. And these are the ancestors of modern-day lizards and snakes. They're called the Scomata. The other group was large. They tended to stay large, and they focused on large prey. This is a group called Archosauria, which means, from Latin, means ruling reptiles. Because they were dominant, they were, again, very large, and they tended to dominate the ecological um, systems in which, in which they lived, which they occupied for uh, hundreds of millions of years. So even now, again, birds combined with their close relatives, the crocodilians, they are still very abundant and very successful. So the Archosauria lineage gave rise to a number of different uh, species uh, during the history. So the most basal members include crocodilians, which are still around, luckily. The Archosauria also gave rise to pterosaurs, the flying reptiles, um, which were highly successful during their time, and all the dinosaurs, the planetian dinosaurs, including these giant dinosaurs, um, and um, the bipedal carnivorous dinosaurs, which include the theropod dinosaurs, and which also include, eventually, the birds. So the entire lineage from basal members, the crocodilians, to all the way to the crown members, the most derived lineage is the birds, is, um, belongs to the Archosauria. In order to understand the evolution of Archosauria, we wanted to trace the changes in the skulls of these animals all the way from the beginning, from primitive Archosaurus all the way to birds. And this work involved uh, close collaboration with um, some important paleontologists, including Dr. Mark Norell from the American Museum of Natural History. He is a chairman and the curator for paleontology. He's actually considered to be number one dinosaur guy, probably one of the most famous living dinosaur experts in the world. And even more importantly, he has a wonderful collection in his museum of dinosaur eggs. He was the first guy who discovered dinosaur uh, theropod eggs in Mongolia and many other locations. And many of those eggs contained fossilized embryos. And this will become very important for our work, being able to understand the changes, the genetic changes, which happened in the dinosaurs. Uh, they will be quite critical for, ex again, explaining the evolution of the birds. So our combined with paleontologists uh, produced some really interesting findings. Um, during one of my conversations, during one of, one of my meetings with um, Mark Norell, um, we realized um, that both of us were speaking about something uh, quite related. Um, he mentioned the fact that after handling hundreds of skulls of dinosaurs and primitive birds, he remarked how similar the skulls of primitive birds and modern birds were to the skulls of juvenile dinosaurs. And at the same time, I was working on, on a different project, uh, looking at uh, development of alligator embryos, looking how they pattern their um, bodies. And then I um, re realized that uh, how bird-like their heads were of the alligator embryos. So we decided to test this hypothesis that modern birds somehow resembling juvenile dinosaurs more formally. So we decided to focus on the skulls 
again, of all the archosaurs from primitive archosaurs, uh, animals like Pearl Lacerda, which represents one of the really primitive archosaurs. It's already a large animal, size of a, a monitor lizard, um, but um, has a number of primitive characteristics, uh, all the way through primitive dinosaurs to advanced dinosaurs, to primitive birds and to modern birds. So we took the skull, we put lots of landmarks on it, so we generated the CT scans and asked the computer to tell us how the skulls changed over time, so which part of the skull it changed, and in which direction. So that's been done, and, um, and we published our report, which shows very clearly that um, during the evolution of the uh, archosaurs, uh, particularly the dinosaurs, the skulls began to elongate, so the, uh, the, the snout became longer and longer. So by the time you evolve this really advanced theropod dinosaur, such as Velociraptor, for example, um, this uh, very aggressive, meat-eating, um, very advanced dinosaurs, again, they had very long snouts with lots and lots of teeth. They had relatively small eyes. They had a pretty small brain and small skull. But this is not how they actually began the development. If you look at those embryos, inside those eggs, which are just about to hatch, or just hatched, these really young um, dinosaurs, their snout is very short. They have uh, only a few teeth, and they have big eyes and a big brain. And that's basically how the bird skulls look like. So if you look at the skulls of both juvenile and adult primitive birds, like Archaeopteryx. Archaeopteryx, we have um, animals which are about two times the difference in size. So some of them are juvenile, some of them essentially adult. And the skulls are very similar to each other, and both of those are very similar to the skulls of, of dinosaur late embryos. That is, they have very short snouts, they still have teeth, but not very many, and they're small. And they have big eyes, and they have very big skull. If you, again, ask the computer to tell you where the birds belong to, what you'll find is that you have this uh, changes in adult archosaur skulls. So they move from primitive archosaurs to primitive dinosaurs to advanced dinosaurs, so this is where the adult uh, advanced dinosaurs sit, but separately from those, there's a baby space. That's where the dinosaurs begin as babies, and then they move from this location to this location. It's a very long uh, route that they take. It takes about seven to 19 years for dinosaurs to become fully grown and fully adult. And it's in this, this baby space. In this baby space, that's where we find birds. That's where we find primitive birds like Archaeopteryx, both juveniles and adults. That's where we find modern birds. And in fact, modern birds are becoming even more what we call pedomorphic. So pedomorphy is a phenomenon in evolution where um, a change in timing of development can cause interesting morphological change. So pedomorphy is um, when the adults of the descendants resemble juveniles, their own ancestors. And there are actually two different ways to become pedomorphic. So one of them is called neoteny. Uh, one famous example of Examples of neoteny is salamanders, axolotl, for example. Axolotl is a larva-looking, uh, mature adult salamander. So it looks like, again, it's um, a, a larvae of its ancestor, but it's actually a sexually mature adult. So that's neoteny, where you, when your somatic development is retarded relative to your um, uh, sexual development. So you develop very, very slowly. By the time you mature, you still look like a larva. The other way to become uh, pedomorphic is called progenesis. And that's basically the, what the birds are doing. In progenesis, your body is developing normally, but you become sexually mature much, much, much faster. So if you look at the time when it took for the dinosaurs or the crocodilians to become mature, and it takes about for them nine to 10 years to become uh, mature adults, to primitive birds and then to modern birds, the time actually becomes shorter and shorter and shorter. By the time you get to the songbirds, which are the most advanced <coughs> modern birds, it takes mere weeks, just a few weeks, for them to become sexually mature. For example, if you think about a modern bird, from the time of hatching, for a robin, for example, it takes about two weeks for it to, to look like an adult. So by the time it fledges through the nest, it looks very similar to its adult uh, in terms of size, in terms of shape. It's done developmentally. So its development is much truncated uh, relative to its ancestors. So the birds, in other words, uh, and we could show that using, uh, uh, using morphometric analysis of the skulls, are highly pedomorphic versions, th that is, very juvenile versions of the ancestors, the theropod dinosaurs. They have very baby-like skulls. And what we're trying to do now, we're trying to understand some of the molecular developmental mechanisms of how that, um, how that change is actually possible. So this is, again, overall, pedomorphy is considered to be an example of heterochrony, which is a very important concept in evolution biology, how timing, playing with timing and development, with timing or 
order of events in development can produce significant morpholo morphological change. So we're able to show again that birds are a result of such heterochronic shifts, the epidomorphic dinosaurs, the baby-like dinosaurs. So the uh, second thing we're doing, second approach uh, out of three approaches, we've done the morphometric part now, we, so we uh, figured out what actually happened morph morph morphologically during evolution of the birds. So now we're, we're doing the comparative embryology part. So I mentioned the fact that dinosaurs died out, everybody knows that. But luckily, we do have primitive archosaurians, the crocodilian is still around. So for this work, we're actually comparing development of um, heads in bird embryos and chicken embryos in the early stages when the face is just being put together and alligator embryos. So we go down to a, a uh, national reserve in Louisiana in southern United States <coughs> and we collect alligator embryos, we bring, bring them back to the lab, we uh, raise them here, we incubate them here and we then uh, compare development of the alligator embryos, how they put their much more primitive looking faces with very long snouts to those of the chickens. And that allowed us to identify particular molecular changes that must have occurred during evolution of the birds, because we found that the faces of the ar archosaurs are actually patterned very similar to the um, way how mammalian faces, for example, in the mouse embryos, or lizard faces are patterned. So they grow a snout, they have this two centers of signaling, basically two grow zones which push the face forward and produce a snout. The birds are different. Because the birds, unlike uh, their cousins, the crocodilians, they have a new novel signal center right in the middle of the face. There is a novel signaling molecule which commands the fusion of all the structures that form the beak and it causes the expansion. So what we wanted to do, we wanted to deconstruct this um, so, that we uh, so that we could actually attempt to push the evolution backward, so to speak. So what we did, we used uh, very, uh, very specific inhibitors of the signaling molecule, and we blocked this bird-specific signaling center, and we essentially restored, uh, we left the this, uh, lateral signaling centers in place, which are still there, but we blocked, again, this novel bird-specific one, and that actually produced a phase which, in patterning, was actually very similar in the, from, the, uh, from the way how it actually developed early to that of the crocodilians, and if you do that, what happens is that the structures which normally in birds fuse to form a beak, or the skeleton forms, kind of turns from the snout to, um, to a beak, actually undergoes the opposite um, kind of um, transformation. That is, the structures do not no longer fuse, in fact, they form very large paired bones, and the overall face begins to look much more snout-like. So if you actually now put landmarks on this skull of manipulated experimental embryos of the chicken, so we can grow them all, my, all the way almost to hatching, so this uh, embryos which we manipulated, and we can subject them to the same morphologic analysis that we used to understand their ancestors. And if you do that, what you see is that the skulls of these experimental embryos, they no longer are found in the space occupied by birds. In fact, they leave it, and the, you find them now among the snouted forms. Among the forms, um, they actually right within the more primitive lineages which give rise to birds. That is, uh, we're able to, by deconstructing the bird-specific signaling environment, by deconstructing the bird-specific changes, we're able to push the morphology all the way back to the ancestors. And the, uh, the exp experiments are ongoing, but we expect, we predict that the more accurate um, uh, reconstruction of the ancestral signaling environment would allow us to reconstruct the ancestral faces, uh, the faces of the ancestors of the birds, much more accurately as well. So that's the direction which work this work is going, and we're showing also that how this approaches, the morphometric analysis combined with uh, comparative embryology and functional experiments can be successfully applied not only to understanding microevolutionary changes, but also to understand macroevolution changes as well.